actually trying to go back and edit a little bit do some editing videos I haven't done that in a while so today's coffee comes from metronome uh, it's a shop that closed down just around the beginning of COVID and they had this great uh, golden milk or coffee and golden milk is a uh, milk or they used oat milk and turmeric kind of like a turmeric um, syrup almost uh, I didn't have those ingredients so I just put turmeric uh, ground ginger a little bit of pepper and vanilla into some cream whip that up and then poured it on top of the coffee and mm -mm, it's yummy I like that a lot so let's take a look at the books that we're gonna go over today I never finish reading my poll that quickly I wish I had that sort of time I don't shout out to people who do I told my LCS manager you know what grab me X of swords I'll, uh, I'll get all 22 issues. I thought it'd be kind of cool to follow uh, an event. Um, and I really dug Hickman. But what I dug about Hickman, besides his indie stuff like Dying in the Dead and East of West, which I'm just starting to get into, is I really like Powers and House of X. But my mind is short and small. And I've forgotten that I stopped getting Powers and House of X after the first two issues because I found it hella confusing. Hell of confusing. Didn't know what the heck I was getting into. So what did I do? I waited and I got the hardcover. Spent a pretty penny on the hardcover collection. Read it and I loved it. But my memory was short, like I said. So I got back to, uh, to this and I started reading X of Swords. I read the prelude and I read issue one and issue two. I don't have time to go through the symbols and all the back matter and stuff, and I was just lost. Sort of following it, but Hickman takes characters. I mean, if they're produced after Claremont and after like Jim Lee's early 90s work, I didn't really read the X-Men. I wasn't reading comics in my you know mid-20s, all of my 30s. Um, I got back to them in my 40s. So, not a problem, but he, Hickman loves to just throw characters in. Um, and... I was a little lost. This one explained everything as only Wolvie could. And this one makes me want to collect the Wolverine um, series here because this was amazing. This was a really cool follow-up. Almost the same exact story um, following right from Wolverine. So it takes Wolverine two issues to get to his uh, sword. This is the variant cover by none other than my favorite artist. Stephanie Hahn, did you see the little SH right there? Beautiful cover as always with Stephanie. Um, Marauders 13, this was a variant to issue five, the one I just showed you. And then I issue six came out today, uh, or came out this week in Marauders 13. Oh, sorry, so that was, um, yeah, good thing I'm editing this video. I probably won't edit that out. That was a variant of five, this is five. So I showed you three, four, and five. Um, and this one was, really nice story of Storm going to Wakanda to get her sword. This book is just kicking ass. It's so different in the style of art from anything I've seen. It's really, really awesome. Die has been hit and miss from the second arc on. After the first trade was amazing. After that, it's been up and down. This is one of the best issues of Die ever. And we'll dive into that in a little bit. This is a blank because even though I'm editing this video, I clearly didn't do a good job of preparing. Love this. Love this. We'll get into that in a little bit. 
And then finally, Lock and Key Pale Battalions. This is issue two. If you've heard about Lock and Key and you weren't sure, or you've tried some of the one shots since the end of Alpha and Omega, and you weren't that enthralled, get this. Get this. This is so good. Seriously, this is the way to go. All right, let's start with X of Swords. Absolutely love this. Benjamin Percy is the writer of words. Um, Peter Bogdanovich, I think it's Peter Bogdanovich, is on the art. Matt Wilson, who's amazing colors in color, and Corey Pettit, who does lettering for tons of comics, does the lettering. Opens up with this really, really cool, almost Terminator 2-esque um, rising out of the molten lava, adamantium that can't be burned. A couple things I want to highlight here is on this page, Right. This is classic Wolverine. Let's see if we can do this. So he's in the brown and black costume. And this was my Wolverine from the 80s, so of course I'm going to love this. This ain't the first fight I went into blind. But losing has never been my policy. Right? Wolverine is a complex character, but he repeats himself throughout 40 um, years of Wolverine. You know the sorts of things he says. You know the sort of way he approaches stuff. Um... And it can be familiar, but if done right, it can still just really kind of give you the shivers and be like, oh yeah, I get that. And I totally get where he's coming from here. So this story is a dual story of two people going after a Muramasa sword, which is, you know, Wolverine. They're always going to bring in Japanese uh, mythology. And of course, Wolverine has to fight the Silver Samurai. And look at this page here. Look at this page here. It's a cool way to have brought back the Silver Samurai. And that's just a great page. Right? He's going through this battle um, with the Silver Samurai. And being Hickman, the story jumps time back and forth, so it's not linear. And then after that battle is done, we get to meet the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the original Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, who are fighting for Arako. Is it Arako, I think? Karako is um, dual opposite from Otherworld. And there's somebody named Solemn who never gets depressed and is never upset. And we're introduced, or perhaps reintroduced, I don't know if we've ever seen this character before, to Solemn. And they have to break him out because he's supposed to get one of the swords. And I realized that I want to jump back here and show you one thing that I loved about this. And I mentioned in the introduction, this little side panel here. So that I can take my place in the Tournament of Swords and settle what amounts to a multi-dimensional feud over land rights. Right there, that's what got me. I'm like, okay, that's a frame I can use to understand X of Swords and what's going on with these different competing factions and characters that are either brand new or that I don't know. And I absolutely love this. So, like I said, the rest of this issue jumps back and forth between uh, Wolverine fighting for the sword, going into the Japanese underworld, and Solemn kind of playing mind games with the uh, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. He's killed one of their um, lovers or parents or something, and they're all mad at him, but they know that they need him because the prophecy has said that they he must be the one to get the sword. So he's like, oh yeah, let's go get the sword. I've been locked away for 100 years, which doesn't upset me. And then Wolverine's going through Japan, and if you've read like Wolverine or, or 80s X-Men, this is all familiar with you. I do like this, though. This character looks like a shout out to Ogun um, from the Kitty Pride Wolverine six issues mini series that Claremont wrote back in the eighties. That's I love that mask; it's so cool, right? And then as we groove along, and of course we're always grooving along, um, he goes up and finds out that the guy who makes the blade is now working with the Hand, and the Hand is now part of a not just an evil criminal organization; they are more like a um, demonic criminal organization and of course then it flashes back or returns to the beginning where Wolverine is crawling out of this lava pit adamantium can't be destroyed and he's going to uh, be alive at the end of it right and then you see this guy saying help me Wolverine with what at first I thought was like Mjolnir I'm like what are they doing bringing Kate stuff into this and I'm like no that's just a, a hammer so some cool stuff there definitely definitely love that tribute too definitely enjoyed that issue so x-force 13 is the next issue and it's just a continuation of that wolverine solemn story uh going for the miramasa blade and this is not as spectacular of an issue but it still tells the story pretty straightforward i honestly don't read all these side bits here i, I wish i had the time um maybe when i get the the trade i will so 
Wolverine and Solemn have tracked the Miramasa blade to this uh, Temple of the Hand where Miramasa has been kept captive and forced to make swords for them, but he didn't realize, like, you know, that he's really making a bargain with the devil and all that sort of stuff. So there's great fight scenes and some philosophical this and that. And you see him forging the sword here. He talks about the process by which the sword is forged. No big deal. A little bit of flashback how Solemn knows uh, that he needs to get this blade. And the blade that he has is a key to hell. So he's able to go in there. And basically Wolverine and Solemn are in prison together. Again, this is a bit of a flashback before the pages just preceding this. Um, and that that makes it kind of difficult to follow um, to follow everything that Hickman does because he flashes back and forth a lot um, and it requires a, a bit of a mental effort to really follow through but I love how they've kept this like hellscape red orange yellow orange brown color throughout most of this issue um, here's the demon king of course he's fat and has horns and a skull because uh, what demon king doesn't uh, Wolverine and Solemn are about to steal the swords that are about to be used to unite like two worlds and two competing factions and if they do that then the game is up and they'll never get to compete with the ten of swords so they stormtrooper style like luke and han on the millennium falcon steal some outfits so they look like these guys and then at the end they stop it and uh solemn bit of a mind trick player he's like hey i've got both swords i could kill you now but something tells me we're both supposed to have them and it'll be fun to have you around so wolverine returns and there's Ileana's got one sword, and he's now got one. And she says, no, she doesn't say anything here. Um, it's in the next issue, but that's bad positioning. Yeah, like I said, I'm editing videos, but you know what? This is my first edited video in a long time. So there you go. The end of that chapter. All right, so this is Marauder's um, 13, part 5. This one I did not like as much um the story was kind of predictable and the artwork was a little not my style i should say um vida ayala and i don't know the other should have looked that up look that up on the next page i meant to do the writers and give writers and artists and colorist credits but of course i forgot i was supposed to do that and so i screwed that up right away um, so Storm is talking to Polaris, do 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 Polaris is like, hey, I've got lots of uh, prophecies that'll tell you what to have to do. And then Storm's like, okay, I know what I have to do. And then she has this little walk in the park with Kitty, um, which I don't love because of the art on Kitty Pride. Right here, I don't know when Marvel decided that not drawing teeth, individual teeth on characters was a thing to do. Um, and I know Kitty's a pirate, but... And I'm sorry, I know her Kate, Her name's Kate. Uh, and it's just, you know, flashback to where I'm from. But I don't love her hair. I don't love her outfit. I don't love the way she's drawn. It just looks kind of um, childish to me. Uh, it's not bad. It's just not my style. And what they do here is they're flashing back. This is really great. So whereas I don't like the, in, the middle art style, I love this exterior stuff that they're doing here. Aurora is a thief in... in I think it was Kenya or wherever it was, and then kind of telling her story, almost dying on the streets of Cairo. There's Cairo, not Kenya. Learning that she can control the weather in the danger room of the X-Men in the early, like, 100s, and then 170-something when she had to kill Callisto to become leader of the Morlocks and how that changed her to go into the Mohawk. And so that whole, that whole sequence is just beautifully done. Really nice storytelling without words. Um, truly a collaboration between artists and art. And then there's the history of the weapon she has to get, which, of course, is a super secret sword we never knew about in Wakanda. Or maybe we did, and I just haven't read about it. So she's got to go to Wakanda. So that's kind of the introduction. Now let's give credit where credit's due. Um, we have Vida or Vida Ayala. Um, he's a great writer. Um, Mateo Lali, whom I don't know. Edgar Delgado and Corey Pettit on Letterer. And Tom, uh, Tom Muller has been doing the design for all of these books. Uh, so there's your creative team. And like I said, the artists, I love what they did in those exterior panels, but not with the um, the Kitty Pride. So I'm not trying to bash an artist, just something didn't work for me. So Storm goes to Wakanda. Storm, T'Challa's not there. Storm asks the Queen Mother for the sword. And the Mother offers all these other swords. And Storm's like, no, I want that sword. And it's like, gasp. And then Shuri's like, hmm. I don't think Storm's going to accept that she has to wait. 
it's like a little too over the top foreshadowing. Right, so then, oh, there's a nice tribute. This is a really nice tribute. Um, Stealth Freeze on the art and Tanisi Coates right there. If you haven't read that, definitely read that. So as we continue, you know, Shuri comes and they have dinner and it's all nice chat, chat, chat. And you know Storm's going to go steal it and you know Shuri doesn't believe her. So there was nothing in here that was um, surprising. Not a bad storyline. It just wasn't that surprising. Uh, Storm changes into her black costume, significant of nothing other than I think she wants to be in a black costume. Uh, she makes it past the guards. She makes it past, and she flashes back to when the child, she was married to T'Challa, and, and he showed her all this stuff. Um, and then Shuri shows up. She's like, I knew I couldn't trust you. And she's like, I knew you wouldn't trust me, and I don't want to fight you, but I'll have to fight you. And the fight scene's actually pretty good. Um, there's a kick that Storm does, uh, maybe as in the previous page, where legs at full extension is pretty awesome. And then Storm electrifies the sword, and Shuri's knocked out for the count, and Storm turns around, and there's Black Panther, right, with these guys who are pretty darn cool. Um, and she's like, ah, I'm gonna get you! And she kills them all, and then T'Challa turns up at the end, and after a little bit of like, I can't believe you did this, I can't let you go, I really need it, you don't understand, let her go. Right? It, it all comes down to this. So it, it really wasn't much of... Uh, a shocking or surprising storyline and then I like this she comes back and Kitty's just sitting there chilling and then uh Wolverine and classic Wolverine never doubted you for a second darling and magic welcome to the party this is a nice wrap up right I like that they're wrapping up each of these episodes uh showing our heroes here but you don't know you don't know if they're going to do the the bad guys that would be really cool if they showed the champions of um, Arakoa, Arakoa, is Karakoa, and is it Arakoa or Arakoa? I can't remember. You don't know if they're going to actually show them, um, gathering too, which would be kind of cool. Coffee's still nice and hot. I'm going to take a sip. Hmm. I really need to get some vanilla bean in there. The vanilla extract, even though it's pure and not the artificial stuff, just has like a alcohol -y taste, which I'm not trying to go for right now. We only find them when they're dead. Uh, really great boom series by Al Ewing, Simone DeMeo, and I'll look at the other creators in a moment. Um, I love this. I think part of the problem with this is my eyesight is not that great, and I read it at night in bed, so I'm a little tired. It's not a linear story, which we've seen with X of Swords, and that's okay. But the artwork is very, is beautiful, and I love it. This is not a criticism, but it's muted and to see these different contrasting shades that are all kind of muted and blend into each other is a little bit difficult for me. Um, and I was starting to lose a bit of the story, even though I loved it. Uh, this guy here is the captain of a crew. And the crew is one of a crew that harvests dead gods for body parts that they can sell. Um, and it's a highly regulated trade with lots and lots of um, enforcers that follow and chase and prosecute and find people who are not following the regulations. Really nice opening page there. Um, and so, like I said, see how dark this is? That makes it hard for me to follow my eyesight, but when I look at it from afar, I know it's beautiful. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on this because I didn't get all the detail. He's sleeping with one of his crew members. He tries to talk her out of his plan, but she falls for it. I've seen people do that before. Um, the plan is to go find an alive god and to uh, harvest a live god rather than a dead god and to, you know, I guess break the market, right? So that's the plan. And there's machinations back and forth, and they keep going um, up here. If you read, it says the year was 2337. Um, every other page, it says the year is 2336 or 2337, so you know that they're going back and forth between hatching the plan or the things that annoyed them the difficulties of dealing with um, regulations and rules and always having somebody listen to their ship uh, to then going forward and actually in this plan. So basically, they warp out um, at one point and they go to, to try to like go to blank space with and, and bank their life on finding a live god, which nobody's ever done before. They don't know if it can be done. This one right here, if I read it correctly, she's the captain of one of the spaceships that's charged with regulating the trade. And she warps with them almost at the same time. So they are following each other. 
uh, some really great artwork down here showing the warping um, through space, you know, just beautiful colors, beautiful artwork. But like I said, it does make it a bit difficult for me to follow sometimes. And I think that's just a 49 year old's eyesight having some trouble and that's okay. Uh, so it ends here with uh, Paula, are you there? And then continued. So I don't think I did this issue justice. It's one of those ones that really is just a visual feast, um, even though visually I'm having problems with it. And I just want to see, there we go. Um, we've got Maria Sara Miotti on color and lettering by And World Design. I hate when they have companies that, that do it and, and do it out rather than letting you know. We only find them when they're dead. Highly All right, three to go. And uh, third to last today is one of my favorite comics of all time, right up there with Sandman and Lock and Key. So I'm very happy to present Die 14 to you. Let me tell you why. Die has been a little up and down. It's always been beautiful. It's always been interesting. I think when Kieran delved into... Um, Tolkien, it was amazing. When he delved into the Bronte sisters, took an issue and a half to kind of conclude that information, you lost the impetus and the impulse beating that um, you had with the issue. Kind of, uh, it took a breather. I'm not sure if it worked overall for the series. When I read it in trade, I might change my mind. I'm not sure. Um, here's the cover by Stephanie Hahn. And like most of her stuff, You've got to look closely at detail to see just how gorgeous her covers are. Here's a machine they call the Forge that they're going to be fighting in the background here. Um, at first glance, it's not one of her beautiful covers like that Marauders 13 that I showed you. But when you get to know Stephanie's work, you get to know that there's lots of details to look for um, that you kind of miss at first because of some of the, the way she does her digital um, painting and the colors. And I'm just enthralled by them. But this week, I will give the nod to Sana Takeda. Um, this is very much like Ash in issue one, um, one of the later issues. I mean, she's not looking in the same direction as issue one. But uh, this bit here, we've also seen Hans do. But the way Sana Takeda does this feathering outside brings you right into Monstrous, which is what her, her big book that she's working on now is finely detailed, exquisite um, pieces just over and over. And if you look, even in the background, she's kind of done what Stephanie does. There's more stuff going on back here. The idea, again, is that the die is a world that's folded out like a 20-sided die, so you get all this stuff. This issue brought it all back to me. The glory of, like, the first arc, I love this issue. So we've got Kieran Gillen on... Um, writing, Stephanie on art and colors, and Clayton Cowles on uh, the work, and the war is really coming to a head now. And so you've got this little scene with um, Ash sending uh, sending her husband, who is also under her control, so she then therefore controls all of his forces, uh, off, to, um, off to war, and he manipulates her into a kiss, even though she doesn't want to give him any power, because she could slip up and give him his power back, and then he would fight her. Um, it, it's a long story, but what I love here is some of the dialogue that Ash has with herself, and it shows that Kieran really has understood what's going on. So right at the top, um, when I was five or six, I used to kiss boys at school. The teachers told me to stop. They said it wasn't right. And in one way, it wasn't right. I should have, shouldn't have kissed anyone without permission, but they meant kiss boys, and I knew it. I don't think about that as often as I should. There's a lot back then I don't think about. And then this phrase right here. I feel that I've spent my life both thinking deeply and not thinking at all. I get that exactly about Ash. Through every one of these issues, she's always had these deep thoughts about the nature of what they're going through. And then she always just falls back into her role of just... um being the dictator and controlling people and saying F it to all the um, <laughs> to all the consequences of her actions. And I really like that. And I also like that they do show Dominic, who is Ash's real world um, counterpart in our world, uh, 
was kissing boys. So was gay, that's something they've alluded to, um, also with his alter ego being trans. Uh, but I shouldn't say it like that. I didn't mean like there's a direct correlation, but they've alluded to both of those things that um, because Dominic is Ash in this world, there is an idea that Dominic is trans. There is also an idea that Dominic was gay, um, but not necessarily. I'm trying to say that those two have to be related. I don't want anybody to think that I'm making that mistake. So beautiful, sumptuous coloring by Stephanie. Gorgeous, gorgeous backdrops. I mean, I just, I love everything about the art in this issue. Absolutely amazing. Um, switch now to Glass Town, where Angela and Matt the Grief Knight and Chuck the Fool are. And Angela's with her sister who had shown up and is kind of this um, burnt out AI. And you know, they're going on trying to figure out what to do. Matt needs to be sad to be powerful. And he's just angry and pissed off right now. And look at this. Just look at that. Just, just look at that, man. I'm going to take a sip of coffee and let you look at that. This is what, this is what just, you know, I think enthralled all of us when, um, oh, John and Bear and, uh, and, um, the comic queen sat down and did our first review of this. We just could not stop talking about these beautiful landscapes. You see that right here in an amazing way. Really, really nice. And as we go through this, um, they're kind of talking about the machinations. I love these dragons here. And they know that they're trying to uh, advance on, I think, Angria. I get lost sometimes with the different towns and battle the forces that um, Zamorna and Ash are arraying against them. Uh, you see Eternal Prussia is one of the places where the, the front of the war was. And then Occupied Glass Town here is where they're headed. Um, Actually, I can't remember what happened in this scene here. I think it's important, but I'm going to move on because I don't want this video to be forever. I love this little sword through the guy's face here. And so they are attacking, and <laughs> there's a big explosion. Matt's all pissed at, at Chuck because Chuck is the fool, and Chuck plays games with this stuff, but the fact is that's what he's supposed to do. Um, and then they get to the forge, which is what is... Their goal is to destroy this machine that I forget what it's making, but it's forging something. And I'm sure it's important, but I just love this comic so much. I'm skipping parts because I usually have to do a second and third read. And so now you can tell by the colors, by the blues and purples, we're back with Ash and Isabel. And Isabel's power is to summon gods to do her bidding. But in the end, she always has to pay. Right? There's always a debt due. Um, she can't break away from that. And so while she's sitting there talking to Ash and they're philosophizing and reminiscing on the, on the war, you get this bottom panel. You've barely seen God in the uh, kind of ethereal backdrop here. Mistress Roll calling. And Isabel's expression is just going to be an, oh, fuck, what the heck is going on here? And Mistress Rose says, hey, you owe me. You want me to help you out in this war? You got to do something for me. And she's like, what? Just tell Matt a little message. Of course, I won't do that. And she's like, oh, yeah? <laughs> Good luck winning this war without my help. Um, and so she has to deal with it. And then she turns to, I don't know if it's supposed to be like a spirit animal or what, just talks to a boar. I've never, you know, never seen that boar. And says, send a bird with a message to Matt. And so Matt and Angela and Chuck are advancing. And then this little birdie comes up and is like, tweet, tweet, I got a message for you. And then right here, we realize the stakes that we're really dealing with is as bad as this war is, this is still a game and a fantasy world to them. Sorry, the camera won't focus on that too much. It says, in the real world, your dad is dead. He left his dad in the hospital when they came back to the world of Die. And now just, again, storytelling through art is what comic books is about. The Grief Knight gets his power from being sad. Look at that. I mean, there's everything about that is as good as any panel I've seen, any comic anywhere, and that could be a cover to any comic anywhere. Often we've said there are panels in Die that could be the cover because they're so, so well drawn by Stephanie. And then as we go to the next page... Boom! Uh-oh. 
Chuck picks up Angela, and uh, Matt says I wasn't there, showing again, sorry, how sad he is about what had happened. And then they start to gather their strength, gather their forces, a bit more philosophizing. And now they're moving forward. And at the end, Matt is supposed to have one weapon. He now has two weapons, both powered, one powered by grief and one powered by anger. So he says, I'm sad and I'm angry. You're both coming with, with me. One for Izzy and one for Ash. He says, this is forbidden. Then he goes, try and stop me. Sorry, we missed that at the top there. So I just love this argument. And again, this right here could be a cover. So die 14, um, a return. To, I don't want to say return to form because they've always been good. I would say a return to top form for die. Absolutely. All right, second to last. Champions Outlawed, number one, by Eve Ewing, uh, Simone DeMeo, and somebody Blee on colors. I'll get to the letter in a moment. Uh, I love Eve Ewing. The work she did on Ironheart, that 12-issue run, uh, I think Bendis and Pacelli created Ironheart, but I think Eve Ewing really shaped her in her writing during her 12-issue uh, run. More so than either of Bendis' two runs. Um, I think Bendis and Pacelli did an amazing job creating characters like Miles and um, Kamala. But I think Eve Ewing is... Not Miles and Kamala. Miles and Riri. I'm glad I'm down to the second to last book. But I, I think that, um, honestly, uh, they've been better shaped by uh, Saladin Ahmed on what I've read of Miles and by Eve Ewing on Ironheart. And now I think her take on Champions, it's one issue in, so it's hard to tell, but it might be might be my favorite um, between Wade and Zub so far. So let's dive into it. Not a lot going on here, and some very typical fare. But again, that is, I think, what makes it so good. And to me, this is a throwback comic. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in an absolutely good way. Um, Tony Infante was on the cover. Simone DeMeo. Federico Bli as the um, colorist, and they call him color artist now, and BC's Clayton Cowles, who we've already seen on Die, is the letterer. There is a number of great variant covers here, um, none of which I got. I may go back and try to get them, but, you know, everybody's trying to get something with these characters on the cover together. Uh, throw in um, Ironheart instead of Nova, and you've got the trifecta, but... There's so many out there, it's saturated. I'm not, like, dying for those. So we start by following Miles through the streets of Brooklyn. Miles gets to school, and there's a fight because some people are totally on um, the side of the, not the Mutant Registration Act, not the Superheroes Accord, the Kosovo Accords. It's now the uh, law against kitty superheroes, we'll call it, because I can't, lax. I can't remember what it is. Uh, but there's a law against kitty superheroes. So they sneak into like an AV room. They watch a, um, they watch a report from what you think is Kamala, but it basically is coming out on the side of uh, what is this? The bottom line is this: the world still needs champions. So basically, it's uh, Miss Marvel Kamala Khan saying that we're going to fight this and we're doing this together. But she doesn't consult any of the champions, as she said that champions will do this. There was some confusion or mix up as to whether this was actually her or what was happening whether she was really saying this i don't know if they will address that or not um some of miles friends get into a fight one girl's like i'm all about this i'm gonna tell on those i'm gonna form a kid version of the anti-kitty superheroes and then they're like are you serious and so it's just like you know the whole idea of kids joining um hitler youth or whatever uh that sort of thing so miles is flying through the street and in what is so obviously a setup but i guess kids don't see that he stops the purse snatching, and it turns out that he's going to get busted. But, you know, the cops are like, all right, we'll let him go. Turns out they probably let him go so he could be traced, because then he goes to the secret, underground, inside, basement room, lair, where all the champions are hanging out. And I like this. One of Jim Zub's conceits was that he tried to do, like, a multi-layered worldwide champions team with like 30 kid characters and i thought it was really cool it just never melded and then they ended his run too soon um so that they are talking to her and you see uh what is it brawn now and you see moon girl and some characters that i don't know but check out starling okay they 
feature her so much that you can't help but think go back and get her first appearance in um miles whatever issue because they're looking to do something big with her um you know if you collect for for value you might want to collect some starling so there's a lot of recriminations against kamala um you know you did this without our our um, permission and then there's infighting between nova and starling is like in your face to anybody who kind of like uh anybody who disagrees with her which will make her a very interesting character and then there's miles and nova saying cool it and then there's um i don't know who all the characters are they're a bunch of cool kid characters um and dust is in here yay dust shout out dust i love dust somewhere makes like one comment somewhere it gets a panel and i'm super happy of course they've been tracked and traced and the, the superhero known as justice is here and he has um Place them all under arrest with Cradle, which is the organization, the fastest, fastest organization that's going to try to stop all of them. Obviously, we'll get to the point where we find out that Cradle has evil ulterior motives at some point in the future. Um, that's just me guessing, but I mean, how could it not? That's the way these stories go. Um, and it turns out that there is an option. If they get an, a mentor, they can continue being a superhero. If they get an adult mentor superhero, but they're all like, oh, the good ones are taken. That sucks. And so then there's a big battle. Most of them escape, a few of them don't escape, and uh, Miss Marvel is like, there's a traitor among us, there's a traitor among us, something is happening. And then as they flee through the rooftops, uh, some of them get out, some of them don't. Starling's like, we gotta go back, and uh, the rest of them are like, no, we gotta gather our forces and get stronger and stuff. And Kamala's like, there's a traitor among us, and then right at the end, you see Viv Vision, or do you? You see Viv's human version, her AI version. Remember back in Champions and that Avengers crossover um, and No Surrender where they had the, uh, the one Viv died and then there was like she was replaced by an all-human or something. I forget exactly, but I don't know that we should take any of this at face value. So this is not a great issue in terms of like an all-time spectacular issue, but it is a great beginning to a fun series that I'm really going to enjoy reading going further because it, it tickles it tickles my fancy. And there's Riri, who didn't appear. The only part of her that appeared was her AI called Natalie, which stands for some acronym I can't remember. Um, but she'll probably feature strongly in issue two because I know she's near and dear to Eve Ewing's heart.